Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending the State of Messaging webinar today. My name is Kaylee Gibbons, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. I just want to kick today off with a few housekeeping items before we get started. First of all, as you'll notice, all lines are muted to prevent any background noise for today's sessions. And because of that, we're going to ask that you enter any questions you have throughout today's presentation in the Q&A box on your control panel. Uh, don't hesitate to ask any questions that you may want to know there, but we will reserve Q&A for the end of the session today. And we'll do our best to address as many questions as we can at that time. While, we're, while we'll be monitoring a Q&A for those questions, you're welcome to add any other thoughts or comments throughout today's session in the chat box as well. Um, in fact, if you'd like to go ahead and share your name and where you're logging in from there, we thought that'd be a great way to get today's conversation started. Lastly, you will receive a recording link to today's webinar via email in the next few days, so please be on the lookout for that. Uh, and without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. We have three speakers on our webinar today. We're excited to have Swathi Theo from Salesforce with us, as well as Zach Kunkel and Brad Dan from Bandwidth. I'm going to pass the mic over to Zach to get us started with introductions. Over to you, Zach. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kaylee, and appreciate everyone for jumping on. Um, really excited to talk about the state of messaging in 2024 um, and just a little bit of background. So we at Bandwidth have been um, doing a similar webinar like this for the past actually six years, which is pretty pretty awesome because some consistency there. Uh, and really the goal is to make sure that CX and product leaders alike know how to navigate the changing business messaging landscape. Um, we know it's tough to keep up. We know that there are a lot of shifts um, and we also know based on registration that a lot of people are really interested in diving in and learning more about this topic. So if you uh, can go to the next slide, I'm just going to do um, one quick plug. Promise this will be my last plug uh, for the state of messaging report, but I'm selfish, so I'm going to do it. Um, so we talked about it a little bit, but six year in a row. And each year as we've done this state of messaging report and campaign alike, We've done something a little bit different. We've done something a little bit more. And so something that we're really excited about this year is we're actually well aware that people may not have the time to jump into the report itself, uh, but maybe you love to consume podcasts as you're commuting into work or as you're running or uh, biking or whatever the case may be. Um, and so we've actually started a podcast all about the state of business messaging where we're having conversations with industry leaders like the campaign registry, like some of our customers, uh, like other industry thought leaders. And so if you want to scan this QR code and download the report yourself or listen in on the podcast, we would love to, to have you there. So if we go to the next slide, um, like we, we already kind of said, my name is Zach Kunkel. I'm a director of product marketing here at Bandwidth, work alongside... Uh, Brad Roldan, um, and I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Uh, again, my name's Brad Roldan. I've been a bandwidth for a long time now, coming on 13 years. And Zach, I love when you when you talk about state of messaging, six years old now. Um, you know, when we started this, it was really meant to be a platform to educate um, the ecosystem, the industry around, like, how do you operate effectively in this in this rapidly changing environment? And we never thought it would go longer than a couple of years. Um, and here we are six years later, and I'm, I'm thrilled. There's so much new stuff to talk about year after year. So thanks for having me. Love it. Swati. Awesome. 13 yeah. years. That's that's a long time. <laughs> so glad to have you here. Uh, and, and Swati, we'd love to have you introduce yourself um, and... As you do that, a lot of people are familiar with Salesforce as a brand, but you obviously hold a specific role within a specific business unit. So maybe also just introduce Service Cloud and what you guys are doing there. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Zach. And uh, uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Swati Dev, Senior Director of Product Management at Salesforce. I manage Service Cloud's uh, digital channels portfolio. Everything from email to messaging for in-app and web, SMS, WhatsApp, uh, Apple, Facebook Messenger, and all of the rich conversational experiences on these channels. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, I, I can just give a quick intro on Service Cloud. 
Uh, service Cloud, uh, as you all know, is uh, the number one AI CRM platform for service. Uh, service Cloud uh, brings uh, every uh, customer service and field service needs into uh, onto this Einstein One platform, uh, which is uh, all trusted AI and data. Uh, this platform also provides a complete 360-degree view of every customer and allows every uh, service organization to kind of uh, scale support across every uh, touch point, uh, boost uh, service teams, productivity, and increase customer satisfaction. And all of this uh, and AI are all safeguarded uh, behind the Einstein Trust layer. Awesome. Thanks so much, Swathi. We're, we're so excited to have you on, uh, and thanks for the quick introduction. So if we go to the next slide, I'll kind of give um, a little bit of a roadmap for today's conversation. So we've got a little bit to cover. We're at a high level. We're going to talk about how is the marketing shifting, uh, sorry, the market shifting from a customer landscape, but then also from um, what are mobile subscribers and end users really expecting from businesses then we're going to take a look at all the different channel options that are out there and even discuss a little bit about how to choose which one is the best for your use case. And then we're going to talk about, uh, if you can imagine a crystal ball, what should you be expecting in the coming year as far as changes, things that we know, things that we're anticipating and the like. So if we kick to the next slide, we will dive in to a little bit of the market analysis and we'll even go to the next slide as well. So um, we are at the great pleasure of working with uh, Salesforce, and they produce a number of uh, awesome resources each year. One of them that's that's really impactful, and anyone on this call would recommend that you take a look at it, but they produce uh, pretty often a state of the connected customer survey, which surveys more than 14,000 customers and businesses alike as they look at uh, different trends that are shaping customer engagement. And so... Maybe I'll ask you guys, everyone, to take a step back, um, take a many steps back, and just ask yourself, what's the number one goal of your company or companies around the world? Obviously, we all want world domination. We want to impact the world. We want to help our customers achieve the mission we're setting out to do. But everyone is thinking about, how do I grow my business? How do I sell the products or services that are within my portfolio? If we can agree on that, the next immediate question has got to be, how am I best going to do that? And so one thing that's pretty uh, profound that I think Salesforce has unearthed is um, the best way to do that isn't just by building great products and, and services anymore, whether it's by providing optimal experiences and removing customer frustration so that you make sure your buyers become repeat buyers uh, and that you provide a really great customer experience. So the shift we're seeing is um, providing a great customer experience is no longer a nice to have, but really a need to have nowadays. So then if we click to the next slide, um, as leaders on this call, if you, if you can agree, uh, you really want to set out and provide that optimal customer experience, um, we then have to ask ourselves, how will I do that? What will I do? And so what we're hearing from end customers, mobile subscribers uh, alike is that they're looking to provide a strategy that is omni-channel and that uh, the digital engagements that they're facilitating should mirror as close to in-person engagements as possible. So if you look at stats like 77% uh, of customers expect to interact with someone immediately, how are you as a, as a business, how are you as a CX leader um, facilitating that over these digital channels. So CX is paramount. Your CX must be omni-channel. You see all these channel options out there. We are obviously uh, in the presence of a Salesforce leader. And so Swathi wanted to give you a question. What is interesting about the consumer preferences that you saw um, as this survey data came out? Yeah, so I, I think the state of connected uh, customer report that you've uh, linked out here has some amazing findings and stats, and you've probably uh, covered the key ones. I actually wanted to uh, re-emphasize a couple of more with respect to actually digital channels. Uh, so the first one uh, I wanted to talk about was just post-pandemic, the shift to digital channels and specifically messaging is become pretty permanent. 
So consumers were, as you all know, uh, already using messaging channels for personal communication and they loved the asynchronous nature of messaging. And the expectation was that the businesses uh, would support the flexibility of being able to communicate on their own time, uh, on the go, 24-7. So that whole asynchronous nature, on the go, 24-7, messages on connected devices, that is what initially attracted uh, consumers to these channels. And on the other hand, uh, businesses obviously wanted to meet customers where, uh, where they were. And uh, initially, businesses also saw this, uh, saw adopting messaging as a great opportunity to deflect calls and reduce uh, costs through chatbots and agents just supporting multiple channels. But reducing cost wasn't the only KPI that improved. Uh, improvements uh, in CSAT were actually uh, a big factor. And if I had to uh, quote one of our customers from Brazil, uh, he jokingly said, our telephone never rings. Uh, we get someone to test the system every month to make sure it is working uh, because they are all on WhatsApp and they are all very happy. And to summarize what one of the sales leaders there told me, it's like, uh, Swati, Brazil is all data, AI and WhatsApp. And our own customer surveys uh, indicate that uh, there is, uh, on an average, 30% increase in CSAT scores uh, for uh, overall service portfolio which includes digital channels as well. So uh, so that's one KPI. The other KPI, I feel, uh, is effective outreach, uh, whether it is a promotional campaign or uh, a transactional notification. Open rates on SMS, WhatsApp, they are so high that it directly translates to conversions. So th that's uh, I think that's one consumer behavior. And then the other consumer behavior uh, I just want to quickly touch upon is uh, customers are expecting uh, connected experiences that cut across service, marketing, commerce, and uh, honestly, even devices. So as a result, uh, you know, most of the businesses that uh, we talk to, they are now forced to think of uh, building these connected experiences across the customer journey. And uh, even companies like Salesforce, uh, we are reacting to this ex uh, expectation. So just as a teaser, we are launching Unified WhatsApp uh, next month that allows a brand to build marketing journeys, uh, commerce transactions, and uh, service all on one number. And this is behind the scenes. This is all on uh, our data cloud AI platform. And the brand has a complete view of that Unified customer uh, profile so that they can actually build these connected experiences. So just wanted to highlight these two uh, uh, amongst everything that's in that report. Love it. It sounds like Salesforce is busy uh, and exciting times ahead. And just want to draw out something that you you were talking about. All of these these channels that you were talking about, they are the exact reason why we're here. They're they're happening over business messaging channels. And so, um, as we skip to the next slide, uh, if you're still tracking with me on this journey, we've established CX is important. We've established it's got to be omnichannel. But really, when we think about one of the most critical channels within that mix, it's got to be messaging. And so if you're joining this call, you understand that. Either you're already experiencing it today or you're looking into how can you build upon uh, that foundation. Um, and really what we saw within our own survey to over 1,600 customers and businesses is that uh, people who are looking to, to build um, – and as they're looking to to solve that with their product, whether that be the problem be patient engagement or marketing and sales, or maybe engaging students and teachers, customer support, whatever the case may be, we saw that messaging was the channel that delivered the highest ROI uh, across the board. So comparing that to over-the-top applications and email, um, and there's probably a lot of, of good information there that you all could glean as you as you read into the report. Um, but one of the biggest reasons why, as we skip to the next slide, that that is the case is because um, it's it's worth repeating. Messaging continues to be looked at as a critical piece because it engages mobile subscribers like no other. It's got incredibly high open rates. It's got really quick response times. It's got high uh, click-throughs um, to drive the optimal business outcome or click-to-action or call-to-action, rather. Uh, for for those businesses, so Brad, I know that we talk about this a lot, and I know that you're you're seeing a trend yourself with some of our customers around the use of media 
in communication. So yeah. shifting from just SMS to MMS. Wanted to hear yeah. what, what you're seeing there. It, it, it's pretty incredible, right? And and so again, I, I, I like to remind people messaging is not new. Um, and, and what we're seeing is this continued trend of consumer preferences, brands trying to match consumers, mobile subscribers on the medium that that makes the most sense and gets the most engagement. And so when when I look at these stats that you're that you have up on the screen here, right, 90 second response time, the click through rate, you know, so people actually responding to your call to action, these are enviable numbers. And and we can't take these for granted, right? You can't necessarily replicate these in other channels. And when I kind of look at the trends from some of the the more savvy brands who are engaging in in messaging, Consistently, we're seeing a smart use of, you know, not just relevant information, but the shift, as you mentioned, Zach, towards including some type of media. And it doesn't have to be super sophisticated. Even things as simple as emojis are trending up, right? So it's not just sending out your doctor appointment reminder. It's including the little doctor emoji in there. And and it's, you know, we're we're visual creatures. Um, and, and so seeing these little pictures are just little reminders to want to engage with with the brand um, who are sending out uh, reminders. You know, the other the other trend we see is uh, like savvy brands who are just sending out um, notifications, more marketing type material, oftentimes are including stickers, animated GIFs, uh, maybe promoting the thing that's on sale or the product that they want to draw your attention to. And these work. I mean, I, I know when I get these types of messages, like I probably click on it just to see what's going on. I want more. And so uh, that that's the trend. That's 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 where things are evolving in the ecosystem. It's not just a simple text channel. It is it's really, I, I would say marketers in general are trying to use this as a true multimedia channel for engagement. Awesome. Yep. And so as we as we click into the next slide, uh, we've we've established messaging critical channel but as you know, there are a lot of different uh, kind of nuances within the channel, different options for for people to leverage A to P messaging. So we're going to do a quick overview of the channels that are out there and about how businesses could be thinking about leveraging those. So as we click into the next slide, just want to do a very elementary exercise first for anyone on the call, but it's an extremely important question for you all to consider. Ask yourself, as you're thinking about messaging, what is the problem you're looking to solve? Is that use case going to require responses from the customer or from the mobile subscriber or not? Is it okay to just have outbound communications or do you want to facilitate a true conversation? The delineation is is really important because whether you're sending notifications and alerts or enabling that, that customer conversation, uh, this is going to lead you to channels that make the most sense for your business. So Brad, I'm going to turn it over to you to kind of give uh, an orientation of some of the channels that are out there yeah. regarding A to P messaging. Yeah, let, let's do that. Maybe just go to the next slide and we can kind of dive into this. And I, I'm going to apologize to everyone right now. This is an eye chart and I promise we are not going to go through every box on this on this box on, on this chart here. But I do think the way Zach set it up is brilliant, right? When we think about the two most simplest use cases across the industry, it's typically one-way notifications where there's no expectation of a response. And then there's there's the conversational type traffic where a conversation might be uh, possible, but it's not always expected. And once you break down into those one of those two categories, you kind of narrow down the field of which are the channels Right, the messaging channels that are best utilized for your use case, your customer journey, if you will. Um, right, and so the notifications, like there's the tried and true short codes that most of us are familiar with. If you're dialing in from somewhere else in the world outside of the United States and Canada, you're probably familiar with other channels like alphanumeric SMS. It's not a thing here in North America. So if you're wondering what that is, um, just think of it as just one way um, messages with a very customized uh, sender ID. The rest of us are probably from those short codes. And then, and then conversational, what's interesting, like if when you, when you say, well, I actually want to drive a conversational experience, the portfolio of solutions available to you is actually much broader. And then you're really coming down to the point where like 
what is the experience that you want to generate? Am I a national brand? Am I a local brand? Do I want to have locality built into this? Um, but without going to the details of each of these channels, I, I would say, right, for all of you product experts out there, your customer journey experts who are trying to design the right experience, generally your decisions come into kind of three buckets. So the first one is, right, I already mentioned, like, what's the experience? What is the expected experience that you want to deliver? The next one that you want to think about then is, well, how fast can I get to market? Your time to market, because what's interesting is depending on the channel that you're picking will actually dictate how fast you can launch, right? And some, some can take as long as two months, like short codes. Uh, others can be done in as little as a week if you're prepared, right? And so those are considerations you want to be thinking about. Maybe the last one, and it always comes back to this, right? We wouldn't be doing our jobs if we didn't think about the cost and the ROI, right? And so most of these channels will deliver the, a very high ROI return of investment for you, but you have to pick the right channel for the customer experience, right? There's got to be a good match. So you would never want to pick a one-way type channel for a conversational experience. That would be not a great choice. Um, so anyways, there's a big variety of, of channels. Um, maybe, maybe Swathi, I'd love to kind of hear your opinion. When you look at these channels side by side, you know, does, does anything, anything stand out for you? I think you covered it all. I think this is a great simplification of how businesses can approach their channel strategy and think in terms of notifications and conversations. Uh, I would say in my mind, all messaging channels for the most part are conversational and bi-directional and where they really differ is technicalities around how uh, the inbound and the outbound traffic is handled, you know, barring alpha numeric, uh, I would say. Uh, so example, like we offer NDLC, toll-free and short codes and they are all bi-directional, conversational. So depending on the use case and you've touched upon all of the uh, uh, all of the reasons, the, uh, the required throughput cost, regulatory considerations and so on, uh, customers can choose the right SMS number for their notifications or conversations. And similarly, uh, OTTs, uh, uh, for most OTT ecosystems, I would say uh, notifications or business initiated messages uh, are kind of supported. Obviously, there are guardrails. Uh, WhatsApp templates uh, allow you to send one-way outbound notifications, which can become conversational if a customer chooses to respond to it. So I think as a framework, I think this is a great way to look at it. Uh, so yes. Perfect. Yeah, thank, thanks, Swathi. Um, maybe, you know, as, as we think about all of these, if, you know, I'm thinking, why, why don't we do an unscientific poll? Um, you know, I'd love, I'd love to ask the audience, like when you look at, when you look at all these channels, um, and, and by the way, we asked this question to 1600 of your peers and colleagues across, uh, across the ecosystem. So we're actually going to compare notes later, but with this, with this group here, let's, let's do a quick unscientific experiment. Um, when you think about the investments that you want to make in 2024, Right. Where, where, where do you want to focus your product experience for messaging, your customer journey, customer experience? Where does your mind go to? Does, do you think about 10 DLC, right? These are 10 digit long code, local phone numbers. Do you think about toll free? Do you think about short codes? If you're outside the U S do you think about alphanumeric in certain parts of the world? Maybe you're thinking about OTT messaging. And, you know, that's WhatsApp, Line, Viber, uh, Apple Business Chat. I think I hit most of the big ones there. Um, go ahead and vote. We're, we're going we're gonna to give a little bit of time for everyone to, to click in their, their votes um, and see what the results are. All right, there we go. Oh, this is super interesting. Um, well, it's interesting to me. I, I think it's actually really interesting to see how this has come out. Um, but before I say anything, Sw Swathi, does, does anything stand out for you in, in these results? Uh, no. Uh, and I'm assuming uh, folks on the call are mainly US-based. So I think SMS continues to be the dominant uh, channel in the US. So not surprising, 10 DLC is definitely the most popular answer here. So I think yeah. it was pretty in line. Yeah. Zach, any, any standouts for you here? 
Yeah, I mean, just Swathi said it well, but the majority of the spend or the majority of planned investments being in 10 DLC uh, compared to that of toll free and short codes would be interested to understand. Um, is that because locality is so important? Is that because yeah, uh, time to time to market is really important? But um, it aligns pretty well with uh, what we saw in the survey ourselves. Yeah, this is super interesting. That I, I, I so what just for side by side. So everyone kind of take a mental picture of, of these results, and why do we? Why don't we see what a larger survey resulted in, if, if we can pull that up. Um, did, did, and, and interestingly, <laughs> the order is almost the same, not quite. Um, in, in a broader survey um, a, across North America, what was interesting is the majority of, of respondents came back and said, 10 DLC is actually top of mind. Um, unfortunately, what we, what we can't tell you, because we can't have a, a two-way dialogue during a survey, um, it could be because businesses are trying to modernize, right? Communications and understand the phone, the voice channel is maybe not as effective as it used to be. Um, there's time to market. Zach brought up, um, there's a simplicity of 10 DLC. And, and so that, that might be what's driving the interest in 10 DLC right now. Um, what maybe, maybe more interesting though, is there is no real second third place here what, what what was interesting is that when you when you look at alphanumeric toll free and short codes it's generally a tie and so 10 dlc generating the most interest right now across the marketplace but there is high interest in the other channels almost an equal amount of interest um it was interesting also is like with our group here the live webinar where there's actually a higher interest in otts um and what this, what this probably doesn't reflect a swath that you, you, you called it out is if we ran this survey, we ran this exact same survey in different regions of the world, um, we probably would expect the, the order to be flip-flopped, right? We'd probably expect OTTs to be much higher. 10 DLC wouldn't even show up as an option because it, it's not a thing in most countries. Um, so, uh, if you want the details behind these, uh, love love for you to go and check out the the state of messaging ebook and you can get more details but anyways thank you for participating in our unscientific survey here um but but what i love about it is consistently at least with the audience that we're talking to 10 dlc seems to be high interest to most people here why don't we go to the next slide move on all right use cases zach i'll hand this over to you yeah so um wanted to put this into practice now. So we've talked about number of channels. Uh, we've established that customer experience is super important. It's got to be omni-channel. But we wanted to, to start to get the creative juices flowing and share some examples from Bandwidth's point of view, but then also from Salesforce's point of view about how are people actually putting ADP messaging into practice. So Service Titan, we're going to look at a use case from them. They're an awesome customer of ours. Um, if you're not familiar with them, they provide a full portfolio of solutions to residential and commercial contractors so that they can manage and grow their own business, uh, but also communicate with their customers, right? So put that uh, into a real-life example. Think about your local plumbing company. They consistently receive phone calls. They're managing technicians out in the field. They're dispatching folks to, to actually go solve those needs, um, Service Titan provides a platform that can help that local plumbing company do all that, right? So a core part of Service Titan's offering is just that, the ability to communicate with customers over messaging. So the use case that I've kind of mapped out on this screen, um, it starts with top left. Uh, it starts with a customer who is calling in. Um, maybe they have uh, a problem that they, they need answered, addressed, that person, uh, the, the receptionist or whoever is gonna jot down some notes about what the problem is, where is the address, um, what day works best for uh, Joe to come out and take a look. Um, and then once that is all done and documented, Service Titan actually sends an automated text message afterwards that says when your appointment is scheduled. And so as that date comes nearer, 
this use case should be very familiar. You're going to get automated appointment reminders so that folks are aware, hey, Joe actually is coming out today. And if that time doesn't work for you, you can reschedule or cancel. Uh, and that allows that plumbing company to save time and money because they don't want to dispatch a technician that comes out and you're not actually there or ready to answer the doorbell. Um, that costs them money. That is not a good customer experience for you. So they're making sure that you're aware of that. But also something that's really cool that Service Titan is doing, and I've actually experienced this as a as a end receiver of this value, um, is they send technician bios and pictures ahead of time so that you can see exactly what Joe looks like, who Joe is, so that uh, maybe you aren't going to be the one answering the door. Maybe it's your wife or your partner or your spouse. Um, and they want to know exactly who it is. So there's some security. There's some uh, actual understanding of who's going to be there. Zach, um, I, I, I love that. Like, I mean, when, when we think about unique use cases in the messaging ecosystem, this is like, this moves way beyond just basic notifications, right? This is not just notifications. This is like building customer trust to your example. And I, I love the idea that I can actually see a photo of the technician that's going to come and knock on my door. Um, and, and it's such a simple thing to do. Um, and, and, and yet the return of value in terms of trust with the company I'm doing business with just shoots the roof for me. So I, I love this as a unique example of simple things we can all be doing to build trust with our customers. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, it's, it's awesome. And having, having been the benefactor of it, uh, hugely appreciative of, of people actually sending those along. Last thing I'll point out about Service Titan's use cases, um, say in that plumbing example, maybe you need to, to have your dog out of the house or something like that. Um, what Service Titan does is it facilitates the ability for conversations to happen bi-directionally. It's not just the appointment reminder and there's no conversation that could happen. There might be requests made of you, and then you as the end customer can send questions back. Hey, do I need to have the dog out of the house or not? Um, and so it, it facilitates that sort of interaction. Um, but just a, just a use case, just an example to get the juices flowing about how SMS and MMS could be used um, for, for your business. But Swati, going to turn it over to you. Um, I know that Salesforce is working with a lot of different types of industries and customers, um, so is bandwidth, but you've got some great slides to talk about common use cases across different geographies, different channels, different industries. So I'm going to turn it over, over to you for the next few slides to talk through that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I'm going to just very high level cover some of the use cases here. Uh, I would say depending on the capabilities, uh, these channels support. And the vertical, some channels might be more uh, preferable than the others for certain use cases. But for the most part, the use cases themselves aren't necessarily very different across channels. They're pretty much the same. And uh, I think what is important is customers expect a consistent and a connected experience across all of these channels. Now, uh, what you see here on the slide are some examples of uh, how we see our customers using messaging, for example, in retail, travel and hospitality. Uh, some of the more common use cases in, say, uh, retail service are around store locations, order status, returns exchanges, and product availability. And a lot of our customers essentially just automate the most commonly asked uh, questions through bots by leveraging the data from the CRM. And uh, there is obviously always an escalation path to an agent. Uh, one example I can share, like uh, I'm working with a couple of uh, retail customers right now that are implementing some very advanced uh, experiences with uh, Apple messages and leveraging Apple's native support for uh, authentication, forms, carousals and the likes. Uh, so everything going beyond text. And uh, the use cases are pretty standard, but where it starts differing uh, based on the channels is how these uh use cases are implemented and the experiences on some of these channels is, uh, is I would say, richer compared to, uh, you know, uh, SMS. Uh, similarly, uh, if you just want to go uh, to the next slide. 
So similarly, uh, we see messaging being used across many other verticals, Pinsev, Automotive, uh, Comps and Media. And this is not a comprehensive list by any means. Uh, and I won't even get into uh, all of the details of these use cases. But one thing I wanted to mention here uh, was uh, that geography actually uh, plays an important role. Uh, so whether it is due to customer preferences, cultural differences, technology, regulations, name it, uh, they, uh, the use cases vary uh, across some of these regions. So uh, last, uh, I spent some time with our sales teams and uh, customers in India and Brazil last year. And some of the use cases were very, very unique to uh, essentially that region. So uh, for example, in India, where a single conversation can have uh, multiple languages, uh, whether it is messaging or voice. Now, the challenges around transcribing, challenges around capturing the history, it's very, very unique to that particular region. Uh, localization is uh, another big ask from practically all customers in our international markets. Uh, I would say, uh, and if I had to share one funny, uh, uh, some funny examples, like, uh, you know, some of my WhatsApp deals were literally blocked on lack of support for audio files, uh, which obviously we fixed, but uh, these are some behaviors that you don't necessarily see in the U.S. market, but these can be deal blockers. Uh, uh, and uh, outside of that, I also deal with a lot of compliance, regulatory, GDPR kind of uh, use cases from regions where I would say data privacy uh, is much more stringent, especially our uh, EMEA customers. So I wanted to cover one customer story, uh, Brad here. Uh, and this is again, uh, to make the point on connected channel experiences uh, that I made earlier. Uh, so this is a great success story of one of our top uh, customers, Gucci. Uh, Gucci, as all of you know, it's a luxury brand, fashion brand, uh, including handbags, cosmetics, and uh, much more. And uh, here, Gucci's global client service center uses generative AI to create conversational replies that advisors can use uh, to provide the uh, on-brand uh, luxury customer experiences across all of these channels. Now, as a backstory, Gucci was one of the uh, first brands in the uh, luxury industry to run a GPT-integrated service cloud pilot on one of the most popular channels, WhatsApp. Uh, and the AI tool in this case uh, suggested service replies that enhanced the conversational capabilities of every Gucci advisor and empowered them with a very distinct uh, gucci fight tone of, uh, tone of voice to use uh, with their clients. And the reason I'm highlighting this is because this is as much a story of connected experiences on digital channels like WhatsApp. Uh, honestly, this is channel agnostic uh, as it is about generative AI and service. Yeah. You know, if you're looking for inspiration for use cases, I mean, these slides are, are, are phenomenal starting point. Um, but, you know, when you when you bring the character out in your business, right, and, and customer, this is like truly a, a, a joyful uh, customer journey. Um, if you're looking for inspiration, that I'll, I'll just point back to the podcast series and actually episode four uh, with our host, Zach, uh, actually talking about other unique use cases across the industry. Um, you'll hear like there's actually a bunch of commonality that you'll, you'll, you're, you're going to hear like Everything from uh, shopping cart uh, abandonment and handmade beds, uh, car recalls, education sector and snow days, like they all have something in common. They have important things they want to get out to their mobile subscribers. And the way they do it through messaging is is unique. Um, and, and actually, I think it can be replicated for most businesses. So it's, it's worth listening to. You, you know, so when we, when we think about uh, the big changes in our industry, right, I, I kind of opened up earlier about it's a phenomenal we're six years into these study of messaging and it's shocking how much change happens year over year maybe the biggest news story that came out in the last was less than six months ago was um apple's announcement of rcs and so if you're wondering what is rcs why should i care we'll, we'll i'll mention that in the next slide but you know, i'll just read this statement out because i, I it's this this is potentially changing like it's it's industry changing and so last later that next year 2024 so this is a statement made in uh late 2023 we'll be adding support for rcs universal profile the standard as currently published by the gsma um we put we believe rcs universal profile will offer better interoperability experience when compared to sms or mms 
This will work alongside iMessage, which will continue to be the best and most secure messaging experience for Apple users. Okay, why should you care? Um, we can go to the next slide while I kind of talk through this. Um, for those of you that don't know, you know, RCS is intended to be the next generation carrier replacement for messaging. It will eventually replace, if we get enough industry adoption around the world, it will eventually replace SMS and MMS. In fact, what the intent of RCS was to bring an OTT, like kind of a WhatsApp, uh, Apple business chat like experience straight into the native messaging apps that we all have on our phones. And the goal has been to keep the standard open so that it can work on any handset without an app download. And that is, that is the killer app if you think about it. If, you, if I can roll out a better experience to every handset in the world without requiring uh, that mobile subscriber to download my mobile app, like that's, that's a win for everybody. Um, there's terms that you're gonna hear. So RCS is, stands for Rich Communication Services, or you might hear Rich Communication Suite. Um, the a to P version of it, the business messaging is called RBM, RCS business messaging. And the reason why we care about Apple is because historically, Tim Cook famously said at a press conference, like Apple was absolutely against supporting RCS. So it just was not part of their strategy. And then more recently, they decided they will embrace the standard. So what this means is, parts of the world where Apple has high penetration rate, we now have both Android and iOS handsets that will be capable of supporting this new standard. And I, I, I think everyone understands when you only have half of the handsets in the world, Android handsets supporting standard, it, it's hard to get excited. It's hard to build momentum. But now when you have all major handsets in the world that will support this new standard, it actually represents a leap in, in positive experience for every mobile subscriber. Um, there are some stats. I, I, I think the, the, the takeaway for you though, as you know, product leaders, customer experience leaders, is that you are not missing out today. If you don't have RCS as part of your strategy today, you're okay. It is something that you need to be thinking about in 2025, right? Maybe 2024 is the year you start thinking about it, making plans, right? 2025, you might dip your toes into it and really start running some market experiments, but it's going to take time. Handset adoption, right? The rate of adoption for a new mobile operating system to take, take hold within the ecosystem is not overnight. Despite when everyone wants to believe, it actually takes months for a new mobile operating system to roll out, hit every handset, and then for users to start um, reaping the benefits of, of those those upgrades. And so I, none of you should feel like this is like, I have to solve it in the next three to six weeks. That That's not what we're here to say, It's but it's something you just want to be thinking about. Anyways, it's, it's a massive change to the industry. I think it's a positive change for the industry and we will absolutely be talking more about this in the months to come. Okay, um, why don't we move on? I think we're gonna kind of move ahead to industry trends, things to be looking out for. So I already mentioned RCS, you know, um, that there, there's, you know, for all of, all of our poll respondents who said, you know, 10 DLC is like really high interest level right now. There's things that you need to be thinking about right now. This is the three to six week or three to six month problem you should be thinking about is there are ch active changes in the industry around toll-free messaging and 10 DLC messaging where you can expect um, increased policy enforcement. So um, to start a campaign, right? To start your messaging campaign with a short code requires a long process. There's a campaign brief, there's a whole approval process, and then you can start sending messages and typically can take weeks to get done. We're starting to see that happen. In fact, we've already seen it happen with toll-free. Um, in 2023, there's a date 
we got a fix here is actually January 31st, 24, when things change. But in 2023, um, you could provision a toll-free number and then you could submit that phone number with your campaign brief for verification. And it would go into a, an intermediate stage called uh, pending. And during the, the pending period, or I would call like a probation period, you could actually send some traffic well, that, that actually ended um, just this past January. And so now with toll-free phone numbers, you have to submit your campaign. You have to get full verification on that toll-free number before you can send traffic. So just like short codes, it's very binary. Just because you got the number doesn't mean you can start sending traffic. 10 DLC is starting to move in that same direction. And so while you might uh, enjoy a little bit of a grace period, um, the industry is rapidly bringing everything into alignment. And so what you experience with short codes, what you experience with toll-free, you will start to see the exact same experience if you haven't already with 10 DLC to the point where you must register, pre-register your campaigns, get everything approved before you can send traffic. Um, for those of you that are knee deep in 10 DLC already, there's uh, you may have noticed it's actually it's a maturing channel and it's actually kind of hard to switch providers um, when when maybe your current provider is not meeting your needs and you need a, a better or different partner. Um, the industry recognizes that campaigns are difficult to move across providers. And so there is industry effort to make campaign migrations easier, right? And so for those of you that might be frustrated, like, oh my gosh, I got thousands of campaigns that I've registered and there's a real material cost associated with that, it's actually expensive for me to go to a new provider because I have to re-register and re-incur re all those fees. The industry is working to, to kind of ease that path for, for all of us and make 10 DLC much more portable across providers. So that's something to look out for. I think it's good news. Um, you know, these are just kind of gotchas that that you want to be thinking about in the next, like like I said, three to six months. Swathi, I'd, I'd love to turn this over to you because I think maybe you have some more exciting stuff to talk about and the trends that you're seeing in the, in the industry. Yeah, uh, so I'll probably just cover this pretty broad for the support industry overall. So uh, just as a background, obviously, as everyone knows, customer service is at the core of uh, customer experience and Arguably, it has seen the most change and uh, I would say elevated importance over the past few years than any other function. So it, uh, uh, I think 2020 was the inflection point for service organizations. Pandemic, as all of you know, accelerated digitization and digital transformation by several years. So post-pandemic, uh, digital channels, as I said earlier, they have become a, a permanent feature in every enterprise's portfolio. Uh, effort to build connected experiences is already uh, underway. Uh, and service organizations are also focused on employee experience, employee retention, as it directly impacts uh, customers' experience. In addition, there was something big that happened last year, and that was Gen AI. Uh, so now, as we look into 2024, there are a few themes, I would say, that are emerging. Uh, the first one, uh, I would say service organizations uh, are taking a closer look at their uh, channel strategies, making sure they meet uh, customers where they are. Uh, what that means is uh, telephony, email, uh, they'll all continue to be a key part of the channel mix. But digital channels, everything from uh, self-service customer portals, uh, mobile apps, uh, social media, VRA, and especially messaging will continue to grow in 2024. Uh, the second uh, insight we are getting from our own surveys is service organizations are also pivoting from being, uh, pivoting from cost cutting to uh, revenue generation. So we've been, and that, this is not new, we've been talking about this for a few years now, but the real reason that this will start playing out in 2024 is, again, Gen AI. As uh, more simple uh, service use cases are automated uh, with Gen AI, uh, the service teams will have more time to engage with customers in more meaningful ways, in higher value ways, uh, and they could become the uh, human face for uh, brands' pre-purchase, purchase, and post-purchase experiences, making you know true connected experiences actual uh, an actual reality. 
And the uh, Gucci example that I shared earlier is an example of how uh, service organizations uh, that strive for excellent customer satisfaction might actually start uh, pivoting to uh, up leveling or, or sorry, up, uh, up upskilling of service professionals and pursuing more uh, revenue generating uh, revenue generation opportunities. Uh, the last point I wanted to make was like, while all of this is great, service organizations becoming the new growth engine, delivering connected experiences, all of that, uh, that's a great objective, but that also comes uh, with a cost and uh, that will result in uptake in the service volumes, which also means there are a lot of questions to be answered. Uh, uh, will service budgets continue to increase to keep pace with this customer demand? Uh, will or how soon will Gen AI actually result in productivity gains for organizations? And how will organizations actually uh, approach upskilling of uh, current service teams? So I don't think we have all of the answers, but I think this is all. Uh, this will all start playing out in twenty twenty four. Yeah, these are these are big topics, Swathi. Um, I, I think it might be helpful if we could hear from you how, how Salesforce is leveraging gen or generative AI for omni-channel solutions. Yeah, I think we can go to the next slide. That I have a couple of slides to show. So I'll, again, answer this very broadly. Uh, first of all, service, uh, sorry, uh, Salesforce has been investing in AI for the last 10 plus years. Salesforce was uh, the uh, first to market with AI for CRM. And as I've said before, trust is our core value. Uh, we also have a collection of safety guardrails, if you will, that we, that we call Einstein trust layer. And our Einstein one uh, platform, the data cloud platform, it allows customers to essentially connect and harmonize all of their CRM data uh, from applications like service, sales, uh, marketing, and all of the external data in one place, and then use that data to uh, provide not just predictive, but generative experiences uh, that are embedded in a user's workflow. And uh, I'll show you one example to actually illustrate what that means. So if you go to the next slide. So this is one example uh, to illustrate uh, this in context of digital channels and uh, messaging. So this is a service replies, which I referred uh, in my earlier uh, example with Gucci. We launched this feature last year and this has provided a lot of productivity gains for many of the customers. And uh, uh, how it actually works is here, Einstein is suggesting uh, personalized responses based on the conversation that is uh, happening in chat. And the agent can edit the response uh, before sending. And in this case, the chat can be SMS, it can be WhatsApp, it can be any channel. Uh, the speech apps uh, as such is uh, channel agnostic. Uh, and uh, if I had to summarize all of this, it is really messaging is becoming the playground for everything AI. And these generative experiences are embedded in the agent's workflow. So depending on the the persona is, they are embedded very much in the workflow. Uh, and then there is always a human in the loop uh, given uh, uh, Gen AI is just uh, so new. And then these experiences are also all grounded in companies' own trusted data. So those are the four a uh, five uh, call-outs, I would say, uh, in terms of summarizing this experience. And there is one more slide. I know we are uh, close to uh, upon time. So I just wanted to leave you with this slide here. And this is really uh, just to say uh, service is one of the most compelling use cases for uh, generative AI. And this has uh, the potential to completely revolutionize how companies interact with their customers. So what you just saw uh, was one example. Service replies is just one example or uh, one of the many experiences that we are launching uh, using Gen AI that will increase the productivity of agents, mobile workers, um, and supervisors. And there are other capabilities like conversation summary that uh, uh, that we went live with, which kind of summarizes the entire conversation for an agent in any chat, increasing again the productivity of an agent. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to quickly mention uh, before I hand it over back to you is co-pilots and co-pilots for agents, uh, uh, supervisor, mobile workers, and even end customers, they are coming soon. And these co-pilots uh, will be running on messaging channels or a messaging medium. In some simple words, you know, think of this as box2.0 with Gen AI. Uh, and I feel messaging will continue to be the primary medium for delivering 
are these Gen AI innovations in the future as well. Back to you. Phenomenal. Thank, thank you for the overview, Swathi. That was really informative. I, I can't wait to see how this comes. I, I appreciate you sharing the roadmap and I can't wait to see this hit the marketplace. Zach, um, do you want to take us out? Yeah, I definitely can. So I know that we saw a few questions coming in. Um, we're obviously three minutes close to the top of the hour. Um, for anyone who does have a question, and if we don't get to you, we will make sure um, to follow up with you or have have a, a bandwidth representative follow up. So I know that we, um, Kaylee, do you want to ask maybe two, two, three questions depending on time? Yeah, uh, really quickly bef um, before we get into so much of the content questions, we had a few come in about the podcast that we brought up at the top of the call and our state of messaging website. So, Zach, if you want to maybe give another plug for that for anyone who is joining a little bit after our first few minutes. Yeah, happy to. So, um, JD, I know you're on the back end. Would you mind flipping through all the way back to the second slide and then maybe we can put up the QR code again. Um, so in case anyone does want to to, to tap in, um, subscribe to the podcast, um, it is called State of Business Texting. You can find it on Spotify. You can find it on Apple Music, anywhere that you get your podcasts. And then also, if you, if you scan this QR code, it should take you to a microsite where you can download the actual uh, PDF of the ebook. Um, engage in all the, the awesome content that we spent um, some time creating. Uh, and yeah, we're excited to hear what your thoughts are. Um, and excited to, to continue doing this even next year. Great. Thanks, Zach. Um, so getting into maybe one or two questions. Um, first of all, a question around toll-free verification. Um, just to summarize it quickly, do we have any tools or suggested resources to facilitate the verification of toll-free numbers? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So, so bandwidth, like our goal is is to help our customers operate at very high volume and scale, and and make that as simple as possible. And and actually, verification and and campaign registrations is is a pretty arduous process. And so, we've actually invested in tools that allow that level of automation. So we absolutely have APIs. Um, a lot of our customers are already leveraging our toll-free verification APIs to kind of fast track their process into uh, getting online, submitting all the right information, and then being able to send traffic once the approvals are done. So toll-free verification API, 100% ready for you to use. Um, if you're a bandwidth customer, just ask your, your uh, account rep about it. And just one question to close us out here. I'll direct this to you, Swathi. Uh, anything you want to weigh in on when it comes to Salesforce's thoughts on RCS and kind of the future of that channel for the next year? Yeah, so I think uh, Apple's decision to support RCS late, uh, late last year has a lot of implications uh, on where we go from here. I think, Brad, you covered uh, this in detail. I agree with everything that you covered. I think it is wait and watch. Uh, 2024 is wait and watch for us as well. Uh, I think uh, new experiences will come out in 2024. So let's wait and watch what Apple launches, how this, uh, ho how all of this comes together. And I think for Salesforce, uh, I think we'll start firming up our plans end of this year, uh, beginning 2025. So I think it really aligns well with everything that you said, Brad. Yeah, it's exciting times. I, I <laughs> like every year I keep wondering what's new and and stuff just kind of keeps happening, right? The industry keeps changing. So this this is a big one for us. Great. Thank you both so much. So I'm going to close this out here with just a big thank you to all of our presenters for joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedules. Thanks to all our attendees for listening in. Make sure to keep an eye out on your email inbox for a link to the recording for today's presentation. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.